things that, um, that have occurred to all of us during their talks. Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> did you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Right. Great. Um, and so, uh, after this, you know, um, just feel free to, um, to come up with any questions you may have um, regarding what we are saying now and regarding the, uh, the actual conferences that have been already, uh, that, that have been given previously. Right. So, we have plenty of time for this. Um, what I wanted to do to begin with, as this is a conference which is centered on the idea of national identity, not to be confused with a nationalist identity, as we said yesterday, necessarily. Um, I'd like to, uh, to ask Nick a little bit about what, what it meant to be, um, to be English uh, at the time when Tolkien was developing his legendarium. We're talking about, well, the first half of the, of the um, 20th century. And so I suppose that there are many diverging ideas about what, what it was to be, what it meant to be an Englishman at this time, and how, how this idea was affected by the historical events yes. taking place. Um, one of the things that uh, we were talking about yesterday uh, was the relationship between the Gothic and national identity, particularly an English identity. Um, and that's very strong up until the end of the 18th century um, in England. Now, the reason for that was partly, as I was talking about yesterday, the political dimension of the Gothic and its associations uh, with the liberal Whig party, uh, with parliamentarian politics, with Protestantism, and with the idea of progress that's come at a terrible cost. In other words, uh, modern society, um, human rights and values are the result of um, civil wars, uh, regicide, which is killing the king, um, and um, getting rid of minorities. So there's a very dark side to history, which is something that the Gothic um, is able uh, to investigate. Now, there's another, yet another strand to this. Uh, which is that there was a one particular reason why the English were very keen at that stage to develop a sense of their own national identity was because England had undergone an act of union with Scotland in 1707. So the Scottish and English parliaments had been brought together to form a single parliament. Now, you may well have taken an interest in recent Scottish politics because you live and work in the Basque country. And you'll know that last year there was a Scottish referendum for independence. That was to separate Scotland from the decision that had been made in 1707 to unite with England. So through the 18th century, um, there's a very strong sense of both the Scots and the English um, trying to maintain their own distinctive national identities. And there's a lot of writing about what it is to be English, and a lot of that is involved about with um, tracing descent from the ancient Goths rather uh, than the more Celtic um, or Gaelic um, Scots. And the Scots are doing the same thing. Um, for example, Thomas was talking about the Finnish Kalevala um, epic poem. Something very similar went on in Scotland in the 1760s when James Macpherson uh, discovers um, an ancient Celtic epic called Ossian, uh, which was hugely popular. Um, it was immediately translated um, into uh, French, um, German, uh, Spanish. Um, it was uh, very popular in America. Thomas Jefferson, the president, read it every day, he said. It was uh, Napoleon's uh, favorite book, and he carried a copy into every battle he fought. Um, and it's also quoted at length at the end of Goethe's The Sorrows of Werther. So this was a, it was a huge European uh, a success story, Ossian was. It, had a, it was influential across the whole of the continent. However, in England, it was simply dismissed as being a forgery. Um, and so Samuel Johnson, for example, a literary critic, said, well, it can't have survived, it's all made up, um, and um, Scotsmen um, can't be trusted. Uh, this debate is still going on um, today, in fact. Now, this distinction between the Scots and the English uh, was something that began to um, be um, eclipsed, if you like, when in order to um, stabilize the British Isles against the threat of Napoleonic invasion in the 1790s, there was another act of union with Ireland. Uh, so you had England and Scotland, and of course Wales, now turning into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Now the consequence of that 
taken with the fact that Napoleon is defeated and the huge success of British imperialism in the 19th century, when British trade takes over a vast part of the globe, is that all of a sudden the emphasis is on being British rather than being English or Scottish or Welsh or Irish. And in fact, um, there are um, politicians and poets um, saying we are proud to be British. Uh, we don't think of our own particular national uh, regional identity anymore. And that sense of Britishness actually gets confused very rapidly with a sense of Englishness. So Englishness and Britishness become what you would say synonyms. They become different words for the same thing. Now, the Scots, because they've invented tartans, um, and the, the Welsh, because they're interested in uh, the ancient Druids, um, and the Irish, because they've only recently been assimilated, managed to hang on to a sense of their own individual, distinctive national identities. But what it is to be English and what it is to be British is profoundly confused, okay? Um, so those words are being used interchangeably uh, throughout the 19th century. Um, and so the flag... Um, of the UK at the time, the Union Jack is also called the Flag of England by Scottish poets. Um, so there's a, um, a basic, a fundamental confusion going on there. Now, this begins to um, break down at the end of the 19th century. So when Tolkien is born um, in 1892, uh, this distinction um, is beginning to become queried and challenged. Uh, the reason uh, for that um, is that Scottish um, and, Irish, and Welsh, and particularly Irish identity, um, is looking more seriously for independence. And so you have Irish, what's called home rule, which is a devolved government, as we've recently had um, in Scotland um, and Wales um, in the UK, um, having much more, much more constitutional power. So once again, politics is very important um, in this, but I mean, I'm sure you appreciate that in terms of your own um, national and regional um, identifications. So these issues are very much brought to a head um, in, first of all, the First World War, um, 1914 to 18, um, when some basic confusions uh, between British identity and particularly German identity and the relationship uh, between the royal families of Europe has seemed to be very, very close, whereas in fact on the battlefield their troops um, are fighting each other. And so as Thomas pointed out, um, there's um, an interest in what it is to be English now as opposed to simply British in writers after the First World War such as E.M. Forster. You also see it in D.H. Lawrence. I don't know if has anybody read D.H. Lawrence? Um, the great um, writer of um, uh, sort of um, landscape and nature uh, fiction. D.H. Lawrence wrote a, a notorious book called Lady Chatterley's Lover, uh, which is about um, the failure of English masculinity after the First World War, which is uh, symbolised by um, this um, aristocratic gentleman um, who's been paralysed um, and, um, and is now impotent. Uh, married to a, he's paralyzed on the battlefield, uh, married to a, a young bride. Um, so she takes as a lover um, the, the gamekeeper, in other words, the servant who looks after their country estate. Um, and it's the, they, they have this very passionate and very sexual affair. Uh, the book was prosecuted and banned for many years. If, if, if you want to learn lots of really obscene English words, it's a very good book <laughs> to read. It's very explicit um, in its language. Um, but it's not just about, it's not just an erotic classic. Lawrence is also very much interested in what it is to be English um, and how Englishness and masculinity um, can be uh, revived after the First World, uh, First World War. Another writer doing this at the same time is George Orwell, um, of course, who writes a number of essays about what it is to be English as opposed to what it is to be British. So when we get to the 1930s, Tolkien is writing at a time when the questions about the relationship of England to the larger British identity are very much in the air. They're being contested, and once again against the background um, of a German um, identity and its associations now uh, with the rise of the Nazi party um, and with fascism. These contradictions become even more acute um, after the Second World War. So that's 1939 to 45. So that's the time when Tolkien is working hard on the Lord of the Rings, and his son Christopher is in the RAF, he's in the, um, his flying 
um, in, um, in the, um, South Africa, um, I think. Now, throughout the Second World War, Winston Churchill, uh, the Prime Minister, is very, very keen to talk about a united Britain. He hardly ever uses the word England. It's all about being British, about Great Britain, about the fact that we are unified um, against uh, the Nazis and the fascists. Um, and so um, the, sim the, the, the symbolism, if you like, of that period is very much about union. As soon as the Second World War end ends, this rhetoric of united Britishness then fundamentally collapses. Um, and you get the resurgence of Scottish nationalism um, and, and Welsh nationalism. Um, and also by that stage, Ireland has already um, become uh, partially independent um, from, the, from the United Kingdom. Um, so the whole notion um, of Britishness breaks down um, in 1945 and 1946, and you have uh, these much more independent um, and um, self-determined uh, Scottish, uh, Welsh, and Irish nationalities. At that point, the English realise that they've invested too much in what it is to be British. They've put a lot of their own national identity, their institutions, their language into a broader sense of what it is to be British, um, and now uh, this appears to, uh, to be collapsing. And so English identity has be really been in crisis since 1945, um, and the English confusion between what it is to be British and what it is to be English um, has pervaded um, politics um, as well as um, popular culture uh, for decades, for many, many years. Uh, when England famously won the World Cup, famously in England anyway, um, in 1966, um, everybody was flying Union Jacks. And there were only one or two commentators who said, you know, the Union Jack is not the flag of England. The Cross of St. George is the flag of England. Why aren't you flying that? And this, and this football is one of the areas in which it's actually come to a head. It's been very, very recent, for example, that English football supporters have started flying the Cross of St. George rather than the Union Jack. Um, and so that's the sense of, of national crisis um, and the profound questions about what it is to be English as opposed to what it is to be British um, are happening right at the time in which Tolkien is writing The Lord of the Rings. And he's very much ahead of the game in this. Um, he's very much identifying those sorts of issues and those sorts of problems and realizing that England doesn't have its national epic. Um, it doesn't have a secure and sustainable sense of what it is. So it doesn't have a Kalevala, it doesn't have a Mabiognion, which is the, uh, the Welsh epic. It doesn't have um, the cycles of Irish um, um, epic, um, ancient epic, uh, myth, myth and legend. And so he's really trying to, uh, to fill that vacuum, um, I think, with something uh, which certainly draws very much on the past, but draws on alternative traditions, um, and also attempts, as we said yesterday, um, to resist the identification uh, with Nazi Germany and the abuse um, of the northern tradition uh, that's, uh, that's evident uh, from that. Now, I think one of the reasons that Tolkien has lasted um, is because he identified those problems very early on and then wove them into um, his legendarium. Um, and so it still speaks particularly in England and consequently um, in North America um, about these questions um, of, uh, of national identity. So it's got a particular place. It's been the most popular book um, in English literature in the 20th century by a very long way. Uh, but what's interesting to me is then how it crosses borders and it then uh, has a global um, impact um, because you know, the best thing about national identities is that they can be recognised and respected and identified with. For Tolkien, and we'll perhaps come on to this now, this was as much a matter to do with language and um, it wasn't really a matter to do with race. It was therefore a way of actually bringing people together, bringing readerships together, that he could identify uh, with the old Norse. I mean, he didn't have any, you know, uh, Norse or Icelandic ancestry, uh, but um, he could identify with the values of old Norse, uh, with, uh, with Germanic, uh, with the Middle Ages, even with French uh, Romance as well. Um, so it creates a much more sort of cosmopolitan um, and liberal way of appreciating, engaging, enjoying um, other people's cultures. And I think that that's, you know, I hope that that's what we've seen with the success, particularly of Lord of the Rings. Um, in the 60 years since it was first published. Okay, thanks very much, Nick, for, for that clarification on, on what it actually means to be 
to be in uh, English in this period, which was a confusing, confusing issue for many people, for Absolutely. many, yes. for many, for many Englishmen, and and uh, people who were part of the uh, of the United Kingdom as well, and I suppose in general, right? So we see yeah. an emergence of these nationalisms, um, regional nationalisms in Wales and Scotland, uh, Ireland, and so on and so yes. forth, right? Um, how much do you think Tolkien's response to this is indebted to the emergence of uh, the Third Reich in, in the 1930s? Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about the idea of northern courage and how Hitler had appropriated that, that mm -hmm. idea and how upset Tolkien was about that fact. Do you think that he, in, in fact, was interested in redeeming this idea through his literature, uh, giving it a, a, a new expression, a different expression? And, and also the national heritage versus a nationalist heritage and, yes. and the idea of empire. Yes. How do these ideas come into play together here? Um, they're, they're big ideas, and um, I think I'll answer the, um, the second point first of all, um, is that um, certainly Tolkien is not writing as a triumphalist um, imperialist uh, writer, but um, he does appear, I think, to be a supporter of the influence, the positive influence of the British Empire, which is understood to be the Commonwealth. Um, in other words, bringing um, language, education, uh, medicine, um, infrastructure uh, to different parts of the world. And I think you can see this very clearly in The Lord of the Rings, um, in, in so far that it's, um, it's, a, it, it's a brotherhood um, or um, a union of different identities, um, different races, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, each of which have different um, and distinctive qualities. Um, and, uh, and skills. So it's very much a, a commonwealth, a British commonwealth ideal. I think that the, the clearest point, the clearest moment of this um, is uh, when um, Aragorn um, and uh, with, the, with, with Mary um, and Legolas and Gimli uh, meet the, the Woses. I don't know if you remember that with Han Buri Khan, um, who's this um, sort of small, sort of rather stunted um, uh, sort of man um, who leads his own, his own hill folk. Um, and I think that Tolkien there is alluding to, to the Gurkhas, um, who are um, a Nepalese uh, um, uh, sort of um, identity, uh, who fights actually with the British Army, still fight with the British Army today. So he's showing that there's a whole spectrum um, of different um, racial and ethnic identities that can actually come together um, in, a, in a combined um, way of dealing uh, with the evil um, of Sauron. Now, I talk about races there, but in fact, to go back to your first point about the Third Reich, uh, Tolkien is much less interested in race um, as a you know, genetic um, identity, um, as having physical characteristics, um, as he is interested in language. He's much more interested in language. Uh, that uh, language, he says, he's, he's interested in people, um, but he's interested not in a racial derivation, but in the languages um, that, they, that they speak. And he talks about this in his lecture um, on English um, and Welsh. So he says, although cultural and other traditions may accompany a difference of language, they are chiefly maintained and preserved by language. He says language is the prime differentiator of people. In other words, it's the prime distinction between people. Not, he says, races. Whatever that much misused word might mean in the long blended history of Western Europe. So he sees that we're already starting at a point uh, where different identities have, uh, have been mixed and blended and combined. Any statement about racial purity for Tolkien is simply absurd. Uh, it can't have lasted uh, for more than a generation or two. It's, a fan it's, it's an evil fantasy, um, in other words. What's important is how people culturally and crucially, linguistically identify themselves. And that gives them access um, to heritage um, and to values um, and to uh, a, much, a much broader um, human community um, and therefore um, to, a, to a future. Yes, uh, more comments on this? Yes? Um, maybe just um, two comments on the... Uh, uh, probably, um, maybe some of you also know, uh, Rudyard Kipling's Book of Books Hill. It's a, a kind of a collection. Well, it's a, it has a frame narrative, 
about two children meeting this kind of Puck, it's a kind of Tom Bombadil figure, well, Puck, this mm -hmm. kind of the, the spirit of the landscape. And um, uh, they have then visions of the history of England or Britain. And so there it becomes uh, clear that those people who live and who um, actually live in the land and who accept the land, they become then some kind of married to the land and it doesn't matter where they come from. Mm -hmm. And they become then, so to speak, the natives yeah. until the next one comes in and is assimilated. But you have to accept the land. And uh, the, 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 the ritual is the seizing of the land. So really, you are given a piece of earth. And when you take it, you take on kind of responsibility for it. It's a very hobbitish thing. And interestingly, I think uh, also for the hobbits, Tolkien, or at least via the mouth of... Um, Ingold Gildorion says, you know, you haven't always been in the Shire. You were immigrants once too. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there will be new immigrants maybe. I mean, Aragorn then kind of tries to at least protect them for a while. Um, but uh, there too, that the typical, what we think has always been there, Tolkien opens up this window and says, no, uh, there was a beginning and there will probably be an end to that too. Yes. Yeah, yes. That, that yes. chimes in very yes. much with this, yes. uh, what you were... Yes, th 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 those different cultural groups do migrate, yeah. they do move around, and in doing so they change because, of, as you say, different landscapes, yeah. and because their language develops. I mean, Tolkien is very interested in um, how language can develop, not only in his scholarship, uh, but he proposes linguistic change within the Lord of the Rings and within the Middle-earth legendary more generally. So, uh, when um, Mary arrives in Rohan, he's called, he's called a Holbitla, um, which is clearly the derivation through what you're talking about with Grimm's Law um, of what the hobbits call themselves. So Tonk is interested in that um, linguistic um, mutation um, or change, um, even within his own stories. And it's, that, it's those sorts of like little um, hints um, that show, I mean, I think that they really deepen the texture of what he's doing and allow readers to really uh, immerse themselves in the imagined world. Just have a, a actually a question. What always puzzled me, if we talk about language and identity, um, it said that when the hobbits immigrated into the Shire, they had their own language, which was akin to the language of Rohan, to the writers of Rohan, because originally they lived in close proximity somewhere on the upper reaches of the Anduin. And then they migrated down into the Shire. And then they gave up their own language and accepted the common language. And this has always puzzled me. And I haven't found yet an answer to that. So that if we say a community is to some extent defined by the language they speak, so the hobbits give up their identity, actually. They or change, well, yeah, well, they, I mean, I think you're right, they change their identity, but is, isn't there a, um, a parallel um, in uh, the language before and after the Norman invasion in England? In other words, Tolkien's very interested in mm -hmm. how far Anglo-Saxons survived. Um, before it was overtaken by uh, the Norman French inspired Middle English. And that's one of the reasons why he's so interested in the, in the poems of the Gawain poet, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, um, Pearl, uh, Patience, and Clenus. And also why he uh, tries to identify um, a West Mercian um, dialect, uh, which I think is in the Ancrena ruler, yep. um, Ancrena isn't it? Ancrena and the Ancrena Wissa. Yeah. Um, and so he's interested in, in you know, were there any survivals of Anglo Saxon after the Norman invasion? Um, you know, why isn't Chaucer writing in um, a development of Anglo-Saxon rather than his Middle English? So I, mean, I suppose that I would sort of compare the hobbits with that, really, that, um, you know, that's, that those linguistic changes can happen uh, very rapidly um, and radically, um, although there will be pockets in which the older language survives. In fact, Gothic as a language uh, survives um, in a tiny... Uh, community in Eastern Europe Crimean. up until the end of the 16th Crimean century. Crimean Gothic. Yeah, yeah. Crimean Gothic, which is absolutely yeah. extraordinary to think that yeah. you know, there'd, there'd been that survival for, for so many centuries. So um, you, you can get these... I mean, it's, ra it's rather like um, you know, theories, biological theories of evolution, you know, the Galapagos Islands. Um, you can get areas that are cut off that don't evolve in the same way because they're away from the mainstream. Um, and so the Tolkien's interested in that linguistic diversity, I think. Okay, I, um, any other comment here? No? Uh, okay, so on this issue here, English identity at this period of time and how it's related to, well, the breakdown of uh, ideas about empire as well and, and you know, uh, the uh, 
internal upheavals on the British Islands leading to different nationalisms. Do you have any questions on, on this issue? Anyone here in the audience? How this is expressed in Tolkien's work or other yes, implications? The few survivors. <laughs> yeah. Or if I could ask you a question, I mean, it's very interesting to me um, how you, as, as readers here um, in Spain in the Basque Country, relate to the Shire, uh, which Tolkien, uh, you know, very um, deliberately portrays, as, as, as Thomas said, um, as, an English, as an English village um, in about 1901. So do you identify with it, um, or do you um, see it as being typically English and something that you can appreciate, uh, but you don't, you're going to be reading it in the same way that you might read you know, Downton Abbey, for example, or uh, Jane Austen? Um, so in other words, how, um, how close do you feel to that, to that environment? How close do you feel to the Hobbits? I can say my, my, my own mm. experience as a reader, a long time ago, by 1982, I think it was the first time I read The Lord of the Rings, was when I came across that metaphor that Bilbo uses when he's trying to explain Gandalf, the way he feels about his, his coming of age, his growing old, and he says, I feel like just, you know, a piece of butter uh, spread on too much bread. ¿Se acordáis? Eh? Me siento como mantequilla untada sobre demasiado pan. <laughs> and you say, that is the kind of metaphor that a hobbit uses. In other words, I think that hobbits and different races in, in, in the Middle Earth are portrayed by means of the way they look at things and the way they give the names to things. Okay, So that it is not the way I belong to the Shire. There is not this, this sense of belonging to a place unless you take the place as something that has made you the way you are, okay? You remember when Sam comes for the first time to Lothlorien and he came into the place and they said, I don't know if the elves made this place or, or the place made the elves the way they are. So this, this kind of communion with, with the landscape, uh, which is also present in Tom Bombadil as a, as a genius Loki, as a, as a spirit of landscape, uh, I think it's pretty much present all over. Also in Hamburghan, as, as, as you know, the one who, to, to, to speak of wisdom, he, he uses the metaphor of the one who looks afar. And, you know, the, the king is the father of the writers. It's, it's kind of a, of a way to, to look at things and to give names, not in a primitive way, but also in a, in a, radical way. Yeah, he goes to the roots of things and, and he puts in the, in the words in the mouth of each one of the characters the way they look at things and the way they name reality from their own point of view. So, for example, when Bilbo says, es un bolsón, non zopen cociñatiesa de casadura. You remember that? <laughs> he's, he's a baggins. He's not someone from, from a different place. But that is not a disrespect to the other place. It's, it's kind of a because he's a Baggins, because of a name that, that that involves and the history that's behind that. And there is a lot of meaning behind being a Baggins. And that is why I'm proud of my, uh, my nephew. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that my, my I, I am not from the Basque Country. I was born in Valladolid. I was born in Castilla. Uh, but I have been, you know, moving from one place to another. I've been moving to... 12 different cities in this country. So my experience as a reader was not connected to Britishness. In fact, I think that Tolkien's one wrote about this, you know, British was not something that they, he liked. He was pretty much uh, attached to the idea of, of being English, but from the point of view of, of, of being English concerning the English language and its evolution, as you have stressed the importance of uh, the the extent of the influence in the survival of Anglo-Saxon even after 1066. So uh, to me, the, the, my approach, my first approach as a reader to the Lord of the Rings and to Middle Earth was that of a, of a wide open place where, especially concerning the Shire, the Shire was a place of anarchy, meaning anarchy 
uh, from the point of view of, of Greek, is an arche. It's a place where no principle, you know, is kind of a, a paradise, a pre-Adanic place where you were, everyone follows their own good common sense. That's why they have six meals a day and they drink a lot of beer because they have, a, you know, and they are pretty much attached to the earth and to the love for tiny things and to uh, no machinery and, you know, the relations of neighborhood and, and good, uh, good citizenship in, from that point of view, which is, in my views, can be connected to what Plato explains in the Republic as, as, as the ideal polis, as how the ideal place should be. It's a small place, no more than 5,000 people living together and having their own kind of, you know, uh, uh, they have a mayor, they have a city hall, and that's, that's all. And they have a, uh, you know, the jefe de correos, the, the postman, you know. Yeah, they have the sheriffs as well who are supposed to keep order. And they have divided the shire in four far uh, things, and that's yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, they are, to me, Tolkien's vision on what to be English was, was, was previous even to the Edwardian times. I mean, he was trying to long, he was longing for something previous to that, maybe mm -hmm. to his childhood when he was living in Serho mm -hmm. and the, the, the surroundings of Birmingham and trying to imagine and recover. I, I think that we cannot lose when, when, when criticizing and analyzing a text, even a mythology, we, we shouldn't miss the point, which is that, that he was a person, which is quite obvious, but at times, in order, when we study a lot of things, we, we, we maybe miss the point, which is that he was a, an orphan. He, was a, he had a happy childhood, but only for a few years. And in a way, he was, I, this is not a Freudian or, or kind of interpretation, but I think that he, he spent his whole life trying to recover that, in a way. Trying to recover the feelings that are pretty much attached to walking in the woods or playing with his brother up in the hills and, and Yes, well, I, I, think that, I, mean, I think that you're right. I think that but, um, I mean, anybody who um, served on the front line of the First World War, as Tolkien did at the Battle of the Somme, um, is going to be permanently affected by that. And then returning to a country that is simply not the same and can never be the same again, um, that there's been an irrevocable change and the past can never be recaptured. I think is certainly um, you know, strongly colours his work. Um, and I wouldn't disagree about the Edwardians, but I also think that he goes back and identifies with an earlier uh, moment, uh, which is of um, late 18th century gentleman scholars, um, who, um, because he's very interested in the history of scholarship, um, and they were the first um, to actually start collecting um, English ballads, start writing local histories, um, and start really um, coming up uh, with a much more ground level version um, of English um, customs and, um, and folklore um, and stories. And I think that um, you know, certainly while the Hobbits are, um, are seen as being possibly Edwardian, um, they also have that late 18th century antiquarian aesthetic. They like collecting things, uh, they worry that they wear waistcoats, they uh, carry pocket watches. Um, they have barometers in their, in their houses. They have all the paraphernalia of that eight, late 18th century uh, polite um, society. Um, and that's just at the moment, as I say, when, um, when scholarship um, and national identity were coming together. Scholarship was being seen um, as a way of uh, forging or um, excavating uh, what it meant um, to be part of a particular land, part of a landscape. Um, and that's sort of blossoming. Um, is something which, yeah, which I do think influences, um, influences Tolkien at that particular time. So, you know, in that sense, you can see the, uh, the Hobbits as, um, as, as 18th century historians, um, as, as much as they are sort of Edwardian um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of society people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe just to uh, add a point to your um, uh, argument that scholarship was important for the nation building or the ident identity of a nation. Um, when there was the, uh, the Prussian-Danish um, war over Schleswig or Schleswig-Holstein in the 1860s, something like that, England was on the side of Denmark, 
versus the Germans, the Prussians. And this had reverberations even in linguistics or philology. Now, suddenly, the English philologists, the English linguists, they um, uh, try to prove that English, which is definitely a West Germanic language, together with German, which is also West Germanic language, is not a West Germanic language, but actually a North Germanic language. So, so you see that uh, kind of politics suddenly spills over into scholarship, and scholarship uh, suddenly finds itself in the round of politics. And I mean, suddenly uh, the Brother Grimm's uh, found themselves in opposition to um, other kind of colleagues. Uh, otherwise, uh, they wouldn't be in opposition. But the politics here, nation building, yes. uh, becomes very important with scholarship. Yes, yeah. yes. And in fact, nation building then does enlist um, a whole range of different activities, uh, whether that's um, building uh, museums um, and libraries. Um, and um, coming up with a curriculum for state education, um, or whether it's writing um, epic um, poetry or indeed epic prose. Um, and you know, one of the things that I mean, people notice, one of the things that really brings them into Tolkien's writing straight away is because he mimics um, so, much, um, so many of the scholarly conventions, not of fiction writing, not of novelists, but of historians and antiquarians. So we get maps, we get prefaces, we get forewords, we get footnotes, we get appendices, uh, we get notes on language um, and alphabets. Um, so there's a whole range of different textual activity, in other words. In that sense, Tolkien is an, he's a great experimental uh, writer because he's drawing on very different traditions. He's drawing on scholarly traditions rather than the tradition um, of English literature. Um, even in The Hobbit, um, the Hobbit has that preface. Um, a little, it's a one-page uh, linguistic uh, preface about why he's decided to um, use the plural dwarf, mm -hmm. dwarves with a V, rather than dwarfs with an F. And you get a map as well, uh, which has got runes um, on it, um, for which no key is given. It's up to the reader um, to then decode um, those runes. And you get illustrations. Now, that's in a children's book. I don't know of another children's book that experiments um, in that particular way. And of course, when we get to the Lord of the Rings, uh, pages and pages of appendices, of, of chronologies, um, of different versions of the same story and so forth. So it's uh, extraordinarily rich and, as I say, experimental um, textual activity that Tolkien is engaging with. And certainly when I was a teenager, um, but as I um, got drawn into this uh, world, um, you know, I learned the Elvish alphabet, so I could translate all the Elvish at the, on, on the title page of the book. Um, and so there are different forms of engagement. Um, it's not just reading, it's actually participating in the text in new ways. You can't do that with Charles Dickens, uh, for example. There are very few English novelists who use maps. Um, Gulliver's Travels, you might have come across Gulliver's Travels. Um, that has a map of an imaginary country. Treasure Island. Um, Treasure Island has a map as well. Swallows and Amazons. And Swallows and Amazons does. But then maps and appendices and forwards and uh, prefaces and so forth, you know, concerning hobbits, uh, for yeah. example. It's a whole range um, of writing activity. So Tolkien shows that all of this is material for the novelist. All of this is material for the imaginative uh, artist creator. They shouldn't just be confined to writing um, a simple story. Okay, great. I mean, we have looked at different, the different roots of Tolkien's imagination. The way Tolkien's imagination worked, uh, it, the linguistic roots of his imagination, that is, worlds taking shape, um, beginning with a word, and then Tolkien inventing languages, and, and inventing the world, discovering, because his idea of inventing was more related to discovering what was already out there, uh, available to his imagination. The starting point were always words. We have also discussed the idea of place, as, as an important uh, category when it came to Tolkien's uh, creativity. And of course, you know, the historical events shaping the imagination of, of the British and English in general, especially the First World War. We saw this in class just the other week, you remember, or just this week actually. Uh, on Monday we looked at the way in which the First World War uh, actually mm, created a, a fissure, uh, a rift between what went on before and, and what came after. And, and so this element of nostalgia is obviously present also, I think, in, in Tolkien's vision. And the ideal response, perhaps, to an external threat 
coming at the end of the story, at the end of the Lord of the Rings, with the scouring of the Shire, of the Shire when the actual the um, the people of the Shire um, they engage actively um, fighting against Saruman's influence, industrializing industrialization of the Shire, effectively, and overthrowing him, Sharky, as he is called by by the hobbits. Mm -hmm. So we have looked at place, we have looked at the linguistic roots. And we have looked a little bit also at the texts, some of the texts that may have given shape to, to the early stories, the inspirations that he, he got. I think one important dimension that we perhaps haven't looked so much into uh, is the way he conceived of older texts and, and missing fragments from those texts and, and how he made use, imaginative use, mm -hmm. of those fragments. We looked at uh, Beartnot, for example, mm -hmm. uh, what he did with that. Uh, but Thomas, you as a medievalist, um, having studied these sources, mm -hmm. what, what could you say about this? What use did Tolkien make of these missing, these absent mm -hmm. pages from old manuscripts and, yeah. and so on? Yeah, well, as, as a scholar, he uh, was often treading a fine line because, between um, actually making things up. I mean, we know that um, in the scholarship, uh, 18th, 19th century, uh, many scholars that didn't have any qualms about just kind of emending or just filling the gaps without really telling you. Um, it took then uh, the more rigorous stance of the 19th century philologist uh, to introduce all these apparatus with footnotes, endnotes, um, maybe different types in printing to make clear this is what it is in the manuscript and this is what I added or what we scholars added. Uh, Tolkien, of course, was very much aware um, uh, that there are things missing, that there are contradictions in the text or in the textual tradition. Uh, let's, for example, take um, the, uh, the saga of Gudrun and Sigurd and Gudrun. Uh, that there, we know that there are something like two pages missing in the one manuscript of the Völsunga saga. Uh, they were ripped out. Someone kind of stole them or they were somehow lost. And so we don't know what happened there. We can make a guess. And many scholars have made more or less educated guesses because we have um, parallel traditions um, in, um, in a German tradition and so on. And Tolkien actually, what his approach was, he kind of rewrote those missing pages in the style of the Saka. So there um, he, as a poet, he kind of stepped into the footsteps of the poet, he had the linguistic and the scholarly means to do so, and produced the missing gaps. He didn't maybe like Macpherson pause them as kind of, listen, I found the new manuscript with the missing uh, thing. Um, he kept them to himself. Uh, his edition, or let's say his commentary and translation of Beowulf uh, reflects a similar sympathy with the author. He often, his comments often show that he f thinks inside the head of the poet and his comments are scholarly but also poetic. He says, now, this passage, obviously, then a later kind of uh, author must have kind of added that or changed it. How do we know? We don't know. But Tolkien, uh, obviously, as a poet, he assumes that he has the critical judgment to differentiate between the earlier, the original, and the later editions. And um, usually, as you pointed out, um, he works from words. There are tricky words, uh, so-called hapax legomena, uh, which are words that occur only once in Old English or Middle English poetry, and if they are not clear from the context, you have no idea what they mean. And he often took these hard words and tried to unlock them. He wrote uh, two articles on Sielwara. Uh, it's, it's an exercise in philology. And by means of trying to find out about the origins and the connections, he again kind of opens up a window into the past. I think at heart he was really a storyteller. And a word for him is the seed to a story. So give him a word and we'll come up with a story, usually. There are also other instances, for example, in the, the homecoming of Björknov. I'm not quite sure if you're familiar with that one. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, it's um, the, the Old English poem, The Battle of Malden, is about a battle, the year 991, of the English under the leader, the Earl Björknov, against the Vikings who harried and invaded England back then again. 
And uh, Beornov, for whatever reason, he allowed the Vikings to cross over from the island where they were camped on a damway onto the firm land and to have battle there. He could have stopped them right on the dam by placing five soldiers there and they could have warded off like Gandalf in Casa Doom, you know, on the bridge, you shall not pass. But the Vikings asked Burknov, uh, this is not fair, you know, couldn't you let us cross and then we have the battle? And he did. And the, the poem said, in his overmode. Now, overmode, yes, we have many uses of overmode. It means something like pride, um, overpride, too much pride, whatever. Overmastering, Overmastering pride. And, um, <coughs> to bless you. And Tolkien, uh, he wrote this radio play, The Homecoming of Björchnov, as a kind of a poetic uh, approach to this situation. And in there, in his manuscript, you can actually see it. He then got onto the problem of overmode. So this time he was first author, poet, and then he came upon a problem that was scholarly. And then the scholar comes in, and then he wrote next to this radio play, he wrote a little article, Overmode, which became very, very influential. I mean, if you're working on the Battle of Molden, you always start with Tolkien's Overmode, even nowadays. And so this is the other way around. Usually it is, you have a scholarly word that is hard, and he writes then a tale to explain it, but it can also work the other way around. He wrote a tale about the Battle of Molden, and by means of that, he comes upon a textual problem, which he then deals in a scholarly way, and it becomes very influential. So, yeah. Does anyone else want to carry on with the conversation here with us? Nick? Yeah, so I think that the, what Thomas has been describing is this, um, uh, it's a very productive relationship that Tolkien has between his creativity and between his scholarship. Um, so the, 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 the two are mutually um, dependent. Uh, they feed off uh, one another. Um, I think another example uh, which is incorporated into Lord of the Rings as a sort of hint um, to the informed reader uh, would be when Aragorn um, remembers the song um, about Rohan, where now the horse, where the rider. Um, and then he gives a little history of Rohan. He says they're an oral people, they have an oral culture, they, they don't write things down. So we've re immediately got here um, a sense um, of a culture which is distinct uh, from the literate cultures um, of the elves and also of Gondor. And of course, remember, it's in the library, the archives of Gondor, uh, that Gandalf discovers uh, the manuscript written by Isildur, uh, which gives uh, the fiery letters on the ring to start his cut it uh, from, from the hand of Sauron. Um, so you get that sense that there are different societies with different uh, linguistic uh, forms of media um, but also, um, the, uh, that poem that Aragorn uh, recites, um, the first lines are based on an Anglo-Saxon poem itself, um, The Wanderer, uh, which is uh, a poem of, uh, of exile um, and the, the Anglo-Saxon doom-laden um, sort of sensibility. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a partner poem to the seafarer, and it's in the Exeter book. Um, it only exists in one copy. So in other words, uh, Aragorn isn't just reaching towards Rohan um, by quoting that. Tolkien is also locating his work within that wider um, Anglo-Saxon literary context. And it, it's another reminder of what Thomas was talking about, um, how he's trying to connect uh, Middle Earth uh, with um, actual uh, sort of... Uh, Western cultural history uh, that, uh, that then supersedes it. Thanks. Um, I think that another thing that we, that we should discuss before we finish this session is um, the mode of literature that he chose to write in, which was not at all uh, the type of literature, the type of genre that you would turn to naturally after the First World War, for instance. I mean, there is a tradition in, in English literature beginning after the First World War of writing um, using sources from a distant past. For example, we'll be looking at uh, Ulysses by James Joyce uh, in a few weeks' time. And James Joyce, what he is doing is that he is making use of um, Homer's original text, um, uh, the Odyssey, and 
he is writing a parallel story, which is set in 1904 in, in Dublin. Uh, but what he's trying to do in the, in, the, in, in the story is to show that there are some similarities, there are some connections here, but whereas the past, as described in the, in the Odyssey by Homer, is a heroic past. It's, um, it's a past in which you can use uh, high-sounding uh, diction, this high diction that we were discussing when we read Paul Fussell's text the other day. Uh, those words were possible, whereas in modern-day Dublin, this kind of language was not possible anymore. And the episodes, the corresponding episodes, would be focused on the sordid, the vulgar, and the un decidedly unheroic. And, and so this is, this is uh, Ulysses by James Joyce is part of a tradition, a high modernist tradition, which became very much in vogue in the 1920s, and it sort of established the uh, standard for what literature, how literature should be written, how to write honestly, supposedly, about the modern predicament after the First World War. Tolkien decided not to do this. Uh, he decided not to say goodbye to all that, as hmm. Graves famously did when he wrote his autobiography in 1929. You remember we saw this, this fragment from, from his uh, autobiography, right? And Robert Graves was very much conscious of this rift, of something having been lost, but he was also conscious of the fact that you could not go back to an earlier use of language. You remember this page I, we read, and the high diction that was lost in, in the Great War. Um, the enemy was the foe, um, the horse was a, a charger or a steed, and so on and so forth. Um, actions were deeds, and so on and so forth, right? So this vocabulary disappeared, and for many writers, most of them, I'd say. And, and, and many of the war veterans, such as Robert Graves himself, or Siegfried Sassoon, uh, in his poetry, he shows this, and in, in his autobiographical books as well, that he says that language, that kind of language, became obscene. Uh, it was, it was um, false language, he said. So there is, there is this sense in which the First World War changes the whole world with its language as well, and there is a new use of irony coming into, into literary language. So irony becomes a predominant uh, literary expression. This ironic clashes between uh, Leopard Bloom in, in Dublin in 1904 and Ulysses uh, in, in classical antiquity. Ulysses having heroic experiences and, and Bloom having very vulgar experiences on every day, uh, in an everyday kind of setting in Dublin, sordid setting often. So, and Tolkien, he did not, he did not do this. He, he didn't want to say goodbye to that. And I was wondering, uh, Eduardo, you, you have centered on words and on his use of words and how important it was for Tolkien to recapture the essence of the whole worldview that, uh, that was transmitted by the original use of words. And if you want to make any comment on hmm. you know, his response to this irony in, in modern language and, and how he, he decided to do something entirely different. Thanks. Um, well, I think we, we tend to use the word irony from the point of view of a, as a synonym to a cynical way of looking at things. And I, I'm sure that Tolkien was not using irony in that way at all. Um, from the trenches, after the First World War, there was a kind of an existentialist point of view on, on the whole thing, you know. It was a chaotic... I mean, to all of us, it's, I think, impossible, thank God, try to imagine what a war is. We have never suffered a war. We have never gone through the situation where we had to kill people or we have to defend ourselves or our families. Or uh, Through the eyes of Tolkien, have you read Tolkien in the Great War? Have you read Tolkien in the Gran Guerra? Okay, that, that's an important book. Uh, in order to pass your masters, you have to read that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But if you read that book, you will see how, in what different way Tolkien uh, survived the trenches uh, by means of hope. And to me, that is maybe the only way that you can survive anything, any kind of suffering. Provided that hope is not something that de depends only on your will, it's not something that is, 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 you know, I want to hope, I want to have hope, I want to, it's not something that is connected to your will. 
but mainly connected to is is mainly a gift, is a grace. And I think it is quite important to understand in what way to talk in grace was in a pagan world, since Middle Earth is a pagan world, in what way he, <laughs> to me, he, he's, this is maybe one of his main achievements as a writer, in what way you can, you can create a whole world where there is no God, there is no redemption, there is no redeemer, there is not even a promise of a redeemer, not even Alf, Alfwin is a, is a redeemer in, in that way. It's only a glimpse of something which is still to come. But at the same time, hope lives in the heart of uh, these tenacious, these, you know, loyal people, Gondor and Rohan, especially the Dunedain, which, who are to me the symbol of, of this, you know, stubborn spirit to go on, uh, not even claiming for what is yours, but, but expecting, expecting and hoping for your time to come. Actually, you know that uh, Aragorn's nickname is Estel, which means hope in Elvish. And, 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 and that is why in the end, the Lord of the Rings is, is the paradox in the Lord of the Rings to me can be embraced in this opposition, apparent opposition between hope and this fighting the long defeat. This, this kind of nostalgia that he felt for, from the, the old world and for the happiness of a childhood that he lost. And, but at the same time, he, he didn't become a cynical person. But I wanted to add something. Uh, are you familiar with the character of Treebeard, Barbol? I'm sure you are, I thought. <laughs> you know, uh, these shepherds of trees, uh, to me, Treebeard is talking in the book. He's a philologist. If you remember when he meets Pippin and Mary for the first time, you, you remember that Pippin says, what's your name? You remember that? Cuando Pippin pregunta a Barbol, ¿cómo te llamas? In quite a hobbitish way, you know, what's your name? <laughs> I am Pippin. I am Pippin. This is Mary. And, and if you remember the text, Treebeard is looking at them in a quiet, and silent and in this kind of a contemplative mood. And he answers to that question, what, to tell you my name, in order to, to tell you what's my name, I have to tell you a story. Because my name is always growing. You see, like a story, it's like something. When you meet someone or you fall in love with someone, you have to tell that person your whole story until that moment. That is your name in a way. It is not, hello, I'm Eduardo. In order to understand who Eduardo is or who Martin is or who Thomas or Chris, each one of us, we have a story behind us. We have a story in our eyes. You remember that Pippin tried to explain the impression that he had when he looked into Treebeard's eyes. And it was kind of a, you know, era como un pozo lleno de recuerdos. It was, not, it was not an animatronic. <laughs> you cannot explain how Treebeard is in a movie. It is impossible because you are missing the point. And, and when Treebeard says, let's, let's go to my house. I'm going to show you my home. And we have to leave this, how you call it. And he, he says, this hill, shelf, step. Les propone tres palabras para decir colina. And it is Pippin who says, oh, this is a hill. And, and Trivia's reaction is, is, I don't think hill is the right word to explain something or to, to, to call something that has been here for so long. So again, we go back to what I tried to explain this morning, that there was a pre-metaphoric moment in, in the history of humankind where we should have been able to call reality, to, to, to say something, to, to, to speak the right word, and to find, in a way, not a metaphor, but the, the true name, which is something that you can find when you read Borges. I saw, I was talking to someone who was working on uh, Hispanic philology. When you read uh, Borges, he, his, one of his main concerns is about the names, and in what way, in what way you can grasp beauty 
by giving names to things. I think that's also present in Tolkien. In Tolkien's view, the only way to recover the full meaning of the world, especially after the, the Great War, was to go back to the invention, to, from Latin invenire, which means to find, in order to find the cosmos, which means in Greek, the order of the world after the chaos of the war. The only way was to invent a whole world based upon languages, based upon the meaning of the words, and the way these words interlace with other words in order to create a feasible world, a world that you can believe in. Not as Coleridge uh, tried to explain when he says that, that you, a good writer is supposed to be a craftsman who can create a world to make to make possible the willing suspension of disbelief. Tolkien said, no, you have to create something. You, can, you, you, you are supposed to create a world where you can, you can have a secondary belief, that you can believe that things are true. And again, we go back to Gandalf. Gandalf is not going to come into this room. But that is not the same as saying that he is a lie. Actually, he is truer. He, he is more true to our lives than, than... I remember watching an interview with Father John Tolkien, eldest son of Tolkien. He was a priest. And he, by 1992, he, he said that when he was a kid, hobbits were so real to him because he was, you know, he was... Uh, every night he met with his siblings in, in one of the... Uh, bedrooms and his father told them the Hobbit and he said that Bilbo was so real and the Hobbits were so real to him that he was not he wouldn't have been impressed to meet a Hobbit at school no se habría extrañado si un día en clase hubiera habido un Hobbit habría dicho pues claro si es es it is part of my life it was part of his imagination in order to create that kind of feasibility Crear ese tipo de verosimilitud, to, to use Aristotle's categories in, in his poetics. You know that, have you read Aristotle's poetics? Have you read La Poetica de Aristoteles? In 1451b, Aristotle explains that poetry is, is deeper than history. In other words, hay más verdad en la poesía que en la historia. Because you can apply poetry to everything, while History was facts that happen. You can make an interpretation, but this is what happened. These are facts, okay? Uh, and that is why I think that, that Tolkien is, is still appealing to a wide audience <laughs> and to different uh, backgrounds. It is not something, we are Mediterranean, but at the same time we can connect, not from the point of view of a nation, but from the point of view of the roots, and the roots of our imagination are, are, are pretty much attached to words. And, and, and that is why I think we can, we can enter that world and, and believe, because as you have explained, every single fact tells you about the story that is lies behind that, okay? and, and that provides the background and the back cloth to, to understand the whole thing. Just one question. Uh, how is the Shire translated into the Spanish edition? Um, La Comarca. La Comarca. And this, I mean, uh, this really kind of carries the connotations of a smallish community like the Shire? Yeah. yeah. It's not, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the difficult words to translate. Yeah. To me, the, the Spanish translation together with the Italian yeah. are the best translations. Okay. Obviously. But, but, uh, Shire is is more. Well, it's uh, yeah. It, it's an old it kind of. It provides the sense of a administrative. Small yeah, it's small. Yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, maybe the, the, the German translation problem, uh, the equivalent to the Shire in German and Tolkien comment on this would be der Gau. Now, der Gau was what was used by the Nazis for their administrative units. So, of course, you cannot translate the Shire with Der Gau. It's like completely wrong associations, you know. Der, Hitler also poisoned the well, yeah. so to speak, yeah. definitely. So we have something called das Auenland, which means the, the meadow land, 
which works kind of for connotations okay, but philologically speaking, yeah, we had to take second choice, yeah. <laughs> it's a final thing. Uh, do you remember, I'm sorry, I'm bothering you with my, <laughs> but I, I'm thinking of Trivier. You remember when he looks for the first time to the hobbits, he realizes that he doesn't know them. And in order to create them, he has to compound a stanza for the hobbits. Do you remember? Tiene que componer una estrofa para que los hobbits queden incorporados al canto de la creación. So he speaks of everything, you know? It's kind of a St. Francis chant of creation. And then he, he said, which is quite an interesting point of view. <laughs> there is a paper there, as Berlin Flieger told me once. He told me, there's a paper there. <laughs> you have to write about that. Uh, in what way you, by, by creating a couple of verses or a stanza, you create hobbits. You say, okay, you are hobbits, and now in order to have you as something, as part of Middle Earth, I have to make a poem. Para, para que los hobbits pasen a existir para la historia, Barbol tiene que componer una estrofa que incorpore a los hobbits a la historia de la Tierra Media. Do you understand? So in order to create them, we, we give names to things because we need how to understand reality. In order to understand the hobbits, uh, Treebeard's mind, which is in my view Tolkien's mind as a philologist, he has to understand by creating a poem, understand by creating a stanza that can be uh, true to, to reality, para ser justo con la realidad que tiene delante de los ojos. Tiene que medirla. You have to measure reality by means of poetry. That is why maybe Tom Sheepy and I think we all agree in this, that, that Tolkien was a poet. Was a poet. And he was a very good poet, in my view. But that has been overlapped and, and you know, maybe at the same time overwhelmed by the rest of his mythology. But he was pretty much concerned about the value and, and, and the, the real, in what way by, by recovering the roots of the words and the etymology of the words in the diachronical uh, outlook, we can recover the sense of the world. Solo, solo mirando las palabras y lo que las palabras significan, recuperamos el sentido del mundo. Hay un pueblo en Zaragoza que se llama Pollo del Cid. Esto en... en Para los cheli, el pollo del Cid sería, pues que llegó el Cid, montó allí un pollo, ¿no? Pues no, el pollo del Cid means that something happened to this hero so that he had to rest for a while at that place. So Tolkien's reaction to that name should be, we have to write a story about that in order to explain why that village, that small town, is called el pollo del Cid. So his reaction to words was, it was not, we, we normally say, una imagen vale más que mil palabras, ¿verdad? And Tolkien's point of view is just the opposite. Yeah, it's give me a word, as you have explained, and I will tell you a whole story to explain that name. How, how to explain, strange as Brie uh, as news, no? Because it's extraño como, como noticias de Brie. Why? Because Brie is in a crossroads. It's in the middle of everything. And you can get news from this place, from another place. And uh, Martin has worked about in what way Brie is a, is a, is a borderline. It's a, it's a place where the Shire ends and a new world is uh, over the horizon. But I wanted to stress this. In what way Treebeard uh, recovers this idea of irony, but not from the point of view of cynicism. It's not a cynical point of view on reality, but on the opposite. It's just the opposite way. The only way to recover the cosmos, the, the meaning of the world, is by giving the names, giving the right names to each uh, thing. Okay. Well, that, that's my view. Could I just, I'd just like to add um, a footnote to what you're saying, Eduardo, which is, uh, first of all, Tolkien's doing the same thing in uh, taking a name uh, the word tame, uh, which is a place in Oxfordshire, and in Farmer Giles of Ham, um, he constructs a whole story to explain how that place is named after the taming of a dragon. 
Um, and also, when you're talking about the, the pre-metaphoric moment, um, that's obviously the Shire um, is, is an English word which is part of um, county names, such as Oxfordshire, uh, Warwickshire, um, Gloucestershire, uh, Northamptonshire. Um, so there are certain other counties that don't have Shire as part of their names, um, such as Devon and Cornwall. But Tolkien is very good um, at taking um, the essential components and calling it the, making it the Shire, uh, the hill, uh, for example, you know, the old road, the old forest. Uh, so he tries to recover um, that um, original moment, that original linguistic moment when places are named. Uh, but if I could just go back to also to, to Martin's um, question at the beginning, um, that um, I think you're absolutely right um, in that many writers after uh, the First World War uh, wanted to change the language, uh, wanted to change the English language and the English, English literary um, language because it was seen uh, to be inappropriate that the language before the war had been one of heroism, uh, one of, uh, that was very sort of upright um, and uh, trying to instill uh, certain sort of values of um, courage and loyalty, which after the experience of the First World War, which was you know, un un unthinkably um, dreadful, it was, it was filthy, uh, it was murderous, um, it was maiming, this was technological warfare and a completely um, new scale. Um, that, that language of heroism was seen to be inappropriate. Now, th this can be taken in different ways. One of the things that's very interesting, I think, about The Lord of the Rings in particular um, is it, it's a book about a war, um, and lots of the actual experiences um, of being at the front uh, are ones that Tolkien puts into that story. So uh, Frodo and Sam being unable to find fresh water, uh, for example, um, is an example of that. You know, they're very interested in where their next meal is coming from, if they're going to get fed at all. Um, and even things like sentry duty. Uh, it wasn't just the enemy who were trying to kill you. Um, if you slept on sentry duty as part of the British Army, you would be summarily shot. So it was actually a capital offence. So when Pippin falls asleep, for example, when Sam falls asleep on sentry duty, there's a very dark undercurrent um, to that. However, Tolkien didn't think that the answer after the war was to purify the language. That was far too sort of hygienic, and you're really throwing away um, the whole history and heritage that's built up uh, that heroic language. But he clearly uh, thought that it needed to be renewed and refreshed in various ways. He's not the only writer who's doing this. Um, David Jones is doing it in his epic poem, in parenthesis, which, like Tolkien, um, uses... Um, old uh, British and English myths, in, this, in that case Arthurian myth, as a way of trying to explain the experience of the past few years. So for some poets, like Siegfried Sassoon, as you say, for Wilfred Owen, the response was um, to actually confront the horror of the trenches. For other writers, such as Tolkien um, and Jones um, and Lewis, um, who had all served at the front, they couldn't confront it directly. They thought the most effective way was to actually think around that subject and present it in other ways. Now, Tolkien never got over the fact that he'd served in the First World War. Have any of you been to Oxford? Um, the, at Oxford, there's the Eagle and Child pub, which is where the Inklings met and where they read their work in progress. Um, so um, Tolkien went there uh, with Lewis, for example, um, with various other... Um, Oxford um, academics um, and writers. Above the fireplace in England Child Pub, you can go and see it, um, there's a memo of attendance from one of the meetings, and everybody who was present has written down their current academic position and the regiment that they fought in in the First World War, or indeed the Second World War, because Christopher Tolkien's name is there as well. So this is nearly 30 years after the war, and they're still identifying themselves, not just through their career and their academic achievements, but through the fact that, you know, Tolkien was in the Royal Signals and he fought with the Lancashire Fusiliers. So it's, you know, they, they never got over that. I'll say Tolkien's approach, like Lewis, like Jones, like poets such as W.H. Auden, uh, was not to turn their back on the old language of heroism, but to think how it could be renewed. And to go back to Thomas's point about the Battle of Malden, um, you know, Tolkien sort of found the answers in the writing of the past. The Battle of Malden has been interpreted as a poem 
um, that's not just about the pride or the, um, the sort of the overmold of, of Bayot Noth, but it's a leader who is modeling himself on Beowulf. Now, he, you know, Beowulf is a superhero. Beowulf can rip off Grendel's arm. Beowulf decides that he's not going to use a sword to, to show how tough he is and that nothing can stand against him. So he's a sort of fantastic model um, of the warrior hero. The problem is, if you try to do that when you've got an army of invading Vikings, you're going to get slaughtered. You know, you can't stand like Beowulf against them, um, and you're just going to be annihilated, which is what happens to Beortnoth. So Tolkien's very interested in how those aspirations of courage and bravery can actually be turned into something which is workable um, in um, post-war uh, post war England. I think that one of the solutions that he comes up with is that it's working with other people. It's cooperation and collaboration. We have the Company of the Ring. Uh, this is a group of individuals. You know, the Lord of the Rings isn't about a single hero who takes on the might of Sauron. It's about people working together and it's about the non heroic uh, working together and showing that they can overcome um, that sort of terrible um, evil um, might. Um, and so um, you do get, um, I think, this sort of sense that the members of the Company of the Ring continue to think of themselves as members of that company, even when they're separated. Um, so even, um, you know, Aragorn says it when they're looking for Merry and Pippin, when they're being taken by the Uruk High, you know, we're the last members of the company. Sam says it uh, to Frodo. Uh, when they're in Mordor, that we're the last members of the company and we've got to see the, the quest to its end. And along the way, they enlist very sort of unlikely members into their company, obviously Gollum becoming part of um, the, the Frodo um, Samwise um, group um, is unexpected, but also absolutely essential uh, to the final climax um, of, uh, at, at Mount Doom. So it's about how you work out, Tolkien's very interested in how heroism can become every day and something that relies on your friends, um, that you go through life not alone, uh, but actually as part um, of a community, um, and that, that those bonds of loyalty um, are actually more important. Right. I don't know if there is anyone who would like to add anything to, to the preceding discussion. Um, I think we are more like to add, arriving at the time, yes? I'd like to add thank you. <laughs> because it is, you know, we're talking about grace and, and, and gifts and, and this morning has been, at least to me, it's a, a nice grace. So I, I'd like to add thank you, everyone. Everyone, I mean, each one of us. Yes, uh, I, I will join in on that. Many thanks to all of you for, for coming to these sessions and I hope that you will show up here this afternoon too. And, I mean, we will be dealing with slightly different things from 3.30 in the afternoon and dealing with what you can actually do with literature nowadays in modern times, uh, how it can be applied to, um, you know, to different sectors out there and, and, you know, especially fantastic literature. And after that, we'll be discussing uh, the tales of the Grimm brothers and what they did to the idea of national identity in Germany. Um, and then there is this guided tour at 7.30 to the Gothic parts of Vitoria. So uh, feel free to join us for the afternoon sessions as well. Um, very good and nice of you to come here and listen to, to these uh, excellent speakers. I think we have had a very, very good and, and complete session here um, to sort of round off the initial, the initial part of the conference. So thank you again for, for being here with us and well, sharing your you. ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So okay. we'll, have a, uh, we'll have a lunch break. <laughs>